Light a campfire and everyone's a storyteller. Join us for some thought-provoking and beyond fireside chats. Welcome to Leave Our World a Better Place. My name is Kasia and today I'll be speaking to Dr. Tessa Hempson, Operations Manager for Oceans Without Borders. Welcome, Tessa. Hi, Kash. Thanks so much. And thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure. We're going to chat a little bit um, about Oceans Without Borders and what that means um, in a little while. But first of all, I just wanted to get a little bit of an insight into who you are and what your background is. You have a background in conservation of all kinds, land and marine. Where did your passion for the ocean originally begin and start and grow from? It's an interesting question because I, I grew up in the bush and uh, the closest ocean was was many hundreds of kilometers away. So it's um, I believe it's something that you know sat in my gut from an early age. But um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a in a very wild environment. So on a farm in the in the escarpment hills of of the Lofoten in South Africa. Growing up in the bush mm-hmm. felt with um, you know lots of wild space around me and parents that were passionate about the natural world and who taught me the names of trees and bugs and birds from a very early age. I think I've just always had a an, an ingrained passion for for wild spaces and I've always valued having you know those big wide expanses around me. I think yeah and then but then so I suppose the bush space was sort of you know that was home that was what I knew. And then going on holidays down to the Natal South Coast with my parents um, and my brother during the school holidays, uh, we stayed with my grandparents and they had a house on the coast that was, mm-hmm. um, I think, a lot of my marine inspiration. There was just, there were windows facing the sea from, you know, almost every room. And this big blue expanse of the, you know, the Natal South Coast was just yeah. like this, you know, endless horizon and just this really kind of wild untouched like next frontier that um just really drew me in and then you know dad of course was teaching me Mm. you know all the names of everything in the rock pools and stuff and it's such a wild coast as well so you you know you've got to sort of you've got to learn how to navigate it you know to just even go for a swim is um you know you end up with your face stuck in the sand quite easily (laughs) so it, it was an environment that just you really felt like you you needed to spend time to to get to know it and um uh all these little treasures on the beach you know like shells and pieces of corals and then dad would explain to me you know like what a coral reef was and they're like these little pieces of skeleton on the beach and to try and reconcile in a child's mind mind you know where this came from and that it was actually an animal and there was this crazy ecosystem out there in this blue expanse and um i think i think that was the original hook and then the more I started spending time in ocean communities, you know, the more you hear these stories of these amazing adventures and these incredible underwater encounters. And, you know, in those days, I'm dating myself a bit, but uh, <laughs> there was there were no GPSs or, you know, anything like that. And if you if you knew how to get a boat through those big waves and get it out to sea and find these reefs and, you know, find the spot you were looking for, then, you know, you'd earn that through really spending time on the ocean and getting to know it. And I think... You know, that that mystery and that promise of just, you know, seeing things that no one else had ever seen before or having experiences that, you know, you'd be telling for years and thriving off would just, I think that really is what drew me in, is just that that real sense of just unknown wildness and adventure. Yeah, it's a, it, really, it really is an incredibly alluring world that just draw, draws you in once you start exploring it a little bit. Yeah, and I know this is something you share, so <laughs> I know you get it. <laughs> so it's a big pull. Yeah, it's obvious that the the ocean had a really great influ- influence on your childhood, and obviously, you know, going on from there on your working life as well. What are some of your best memories connected with the ocean? Sure, that's a very difficult question <laughs> because I I find as I'm sure you've experienced, you know, every time you you put yourself out on the water or put your head underwater, you know, there's a, there's always something new that is just, you know, what, what keeps you mm-hmm. coming back, I think. But, um, and I've, I've been blessed with so many amazing underwater experiences, but I think with like most people, you know, it's, it's often the big stuff that really hooks you in. Right. So I remember my first dive with sharks, which was down fairly far from proper coral reefs on the East London coast when I just started diving. And that was, it was remarkable. It was a late afternoon dive. So you get that really kind of eerie mm-hmm. sort of light underwater because the light disappears so much quicker underwater. 
and we had two bronze whalers or two that we could see there could have been more but um these sharks that were coming in and, and having a really close look at us and then you know as they got close they'd flick their tails and there's like this crack in the water and then disappear off into the murk and then you know a couple of seconds later they'd come around again and i was just i mean it, it was amazing so i don't think there was any fear there it was just uh, it was pure amazement and adrenaline and i know I, I could hardly sleep that night with um you know just this amazing experience that i'd encountered and you know there's no turning back from there and i love i love spending time with those predators underwater you know vermezi which is obviously where i spend a lot of time these days i'm very lucky to be able to do that but there's a particular site there that i you know if, if i had to pick one place underwater i think that would be it it's just remarkable i mean the first time i dived there it absolutely blew me away the philly um overconfident <laughs> dive guide that took me on the dive and I'm going to take you on the best dive of your life I thought yeah yeah he was right hey it changed my life because it's um it's a combination of you know just these magnificent predators it's it's an aggregation site where you get a whole bunch of sharks coming together for for breeding and then they raise their the young there as well which is really special and there were just sharks everywhere and then the other thing that I absolutely adore underwater is um drop-offs you know so these big walls and when you see a just disappearing into absolute nothing like into this abyss it's, it's such a wonderfully confronting experience I think it's the same with predators as well is that you you just feel you feel smaller which is really nice you know you just you're back you're back in context on the world and it's that it you know when you look down a wall that just disappears into nothing you just you just feel like there's there's so much more that's undiscovered and that you know we we haven't figured it all out we haven't you know overexploited everything you know there, there is still this like you know unbelievable mystery and beyond that still exists and I think that's those those are some of my most amazing experiences underwater is where where you get that feeling of being small and part of such a massive big amazing ecosystem one of these days I'm going to ask you about your favorite dive sites but I have a feeling that would be a podcast all on its own so <laughs> we'll leave it for today. <laughs> cool <laughs> we can do that that's a date <laughs> You know, whenever you talk to any diver or actually any fisherman or pretty much any, anybody connected with the ocean, they always have these tales of how, you know, things have changed and the fish were so much bigger and everything was so much better in the old days. And I know a lot of people just talk it down to fishermen's tales and take it with a grain of salt. But the truth is that the marine world is changing and it's changing really quickly. How have you seen the oceans change during your career? Sure. No, yeah, you're right, Kash. They, I mean, they, they are changing, you know, and the that's one of the fundamental problems on our planet, I think, is that, like you say, that um, we put it down to kind of, you know, fishermen's tails. And it's the idea of shifting baselines. So you only mm -hmm. know what you see in your short lifetime. Um, and then that knowledge is lost, you know. So whatever we start with is what we consider normal. And for people coming into the world today, you know, what they see now is normal. So there's this kind of shifting understanding of what's what's acceptable and what's what's a pristine ecosystem. But the rate of change now is just unbelievable. So I was lucky enough to be able to do my PhD at one of the, the real centers of marine research in the world, particularly for coral reefs um, at James Cook University in Australia. And I did a huge number of my, or great amount of my work was on the Great Barrier Reef. And then I also had a few sites mm -hmm. in, in Seychelles in the Western Indian Ocean. And working on coral reef ecosystems, you there's no ways that you can deny that the change isn't happening very, very quickly. They really are one of the sort of canaries in the cage in terms of ecosystems on our planet that are, you know, showing us the impacts that are happening. So on with my work, I was looking at how uh, coral reefs when they when they degrade, whether it's from flooding, you know, from sediment from rivers or from coral bleaching or from netting impact or dynamiting or whatever it is, um, you know, how what the impact is through the food web, so through the fish that, that live on that reef. And a PhD is not a very long period of time, you know, it's in my case, it was four years. And in the time that I was working on, on my PhD, the I watched almost every single one of the sites that I worked on actually vanish you know so the the corals we had i worked up on lizard island which has been hugely impacted unfortunately and there's there's amazing regeneration there as well but in the space of a few years 
all of these reefs that I grew to know so well initially, they absolutely vanished. I remember on the last day of my um, my field work, I went to go free diving just around the island as a bit of time out. And the reefs were gone. So between a massive cyclone and then a massive bleaching event, the corals had just been ripped, literally ripped off the rocks by the cyclones. And then those that had made it through that had been bleached um, and then disintegrated. And these cumulative impacts were like, there, there's just no denying when reefs are disappearing in front of your eyes in timescales of, you know, a few years. And those reefs are actually, you know, to, to put it in, in context, it was, it was a lot of the, the Chasing Coral film on, on Netflix. It was those, a lot of those reefs were the ones that they filmed with the bleaching impacts. So, yeah, coral reef ecosystems, I think, are a, they're a, they're a very clear <laughs> um, indicator of how reefs are or how our impacts, our oceans have been impacted. And then, I mean, you know, in terms of fish sizes and numbers, you know, there's, um, I find old photo photographs are, are often a really good benchmark, you know, a real honest indicator of what's, how the change has happened. And you see the, the old fishing photos from, you know, 50, 50 years ago, and that's not so long ago, of the fish that they were catching on the Zululand coast in South Africa. And, you know, they have the guys fish all laid out on the beach in front of them. And that was the day's catch. And fishermen see that now, today, and those are still very healthy ecosystems. But they'll see those catches today and go, geez, you know, the old days, that was, that was something else, eh? Yes. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and then the, I guess the other major, major one that's, you know, mm. most people can probably relate to if they spend any time with the ocean is the pollution side of things. So, I mean, you know, you, when you walk down a beach, mm. um, you know, as a kid that's on crazy. holiday mm. 30 years ago, you know, if you found plastic on the beach, it was sort of a, it was like, oh, look, he has a piece of plastic. You know, it was something that it wasn't the norm. It was something that you picked it up and you put it in the bin and it was like one piece. And now, most, most beaches in the world, if you take a handful of sand and you, you put it in a bowl of water, the sand will sink to the bottom and there'll generally be, you know, hundreds of little pieces of, of broken down plastic floating on the surface of the water. And that's, that's the you know, yeah, that's that's a reality. Now, I think for a lot of people, maybe because it's not so obvious, they're not in the water and and seeing these things and seeing the changes that happen for themselves. I think a lot of people don't really understand the impact or how it ties into into our environment and our system as a whole. Can you just explain a little bit about how does marine conservation affect life on Earth and our entire environment as a whole. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's, you know, you, you hear the stats sort of fired off at you all the time. And it, as a scientist and a marine conservationist, I, I often don't absorb them. But, you know, the, the scale of impact of the ocean in, in everyone's lives is just, it's, it's enormous. You know, the oceans cover 70% of our, our planet. They hold 97% of the planet's water. They're responsible for at least half the oxygen we breathe so you know you think about like what your daily life would be without that you know it's, it's no oceans and it doesn't matter where you live whether you're on the coast or not you know that the impact of that is going to be felt and then you know for food in terms of fisheries you know a huge proportion of the planet rely on on fish for for food and i think many of us don't even realize what a big part of our diets food fish makes up because a lot of protein, so, you know, cows and goats and chickens and um, pigs and all sorts of things are actually, in a lot of places, they're fed on fish meal. So we're mm -hmm. fishing our oceans to feed our livestock, which is feeding our demand for, for protein. And I think these these links and these incredibly high levels of exploitation on, on marine resources, you know, we don't understand what a huge part that plays in our daily lives. And then obviously, you know, uh, with um, one of the biggest impacts um, – on our planet at the moment is obviously rising um, carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere. And our oceans are, like we, we hear all the time as well, they're, they're sucking all that, that carbon dioxide up. So they do this wonderful job of, of sucking up the carbon and giving us oxygen, which is just the most incredible service. But there's only so much that they can take as well. And as the oceans warm, you know, we hear about the, the rising sea levels. And we've got, you know, 40% of our world's population live within 100 kilometers of the coastline which means they're very directly affected by what happens in the ocean, whether it's mm. rising sea levels or bigger storms or loss of fish and livelihoods, whether it's tourism and the the weather systems that the ocean drives as well. So as the water heats up, you know, I mean, you just look at a, a pot boiling when you're making pasta, you know, that 
and water, it, it creates a lot of energy. And I mean, we're not boiling our oceans, but evaporating our oceans is what drives clouds with, and currents get moved around and all of those big, big cycles on our planet, you know, that's driven by the water in the oceans and the heat that they carry, the carbon dioxide that they carry. So when we start messing up those balances, you know, there's a certain amount that can be absorbed, but there are obviously yeah. tipping points. And those tipping points are going to make life a lot more difficult for us, you know. So I was actually, I was talking to one of our, so obviously one of our sites is, is Benguera and we was chatting to the team on Benguera yesterday about we what we need to be doing, like what our strategy needs to be at the moment. And a lot of our work is, is working with the local communities who are obviously massively reliant on the ocean for, for their food, for their livelihoods, through mm-hmm. ecotourism, very often for the structures that build their homes. You know, it's it's they're very directly related to that and obviously a big part of the conservation that needs to happen. How do we make those connections very clear about how, in, how important it is to mm-hmm. conserve the oceans for the futures um, of people that are so directly reliant. The realities are, if those ecosystems are damaged, then not only does the food go in terms of direct fishing resources, but you're going to lose a lot of revenue in terms of ecotourism, which provides a lot of jobs, you know, not only directly, but through the industries that they support. So whether it's local communities or tourism operators or fishing companies, you know, that losing our planet's marine resources or upsetting the balances, the the knock-on effects are immense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's huge. It's uh, everything's interrelated and all and all connected. Absolutely. Perhaps this is a this is a good time. We spoke. A, you've spoken a little bit about about Benguera and and tourism. Can you tell us in a bit more detail what exactly is Oceans Without Borders? How does it tie into tourism and into communities? And what are the project's objectives? Sure. So Ocean South Borders has been um, has been life for me for the last three years. So I had that up with a with a team of, of great great inspiring people. But uh, the project is a it's a partnership between Africa Foundation, which is a, a not for profit NGO or, or organization that's uh, focused on community development largely, and then and beyond, which is a high end ecotourism company, mm-hmm. and the. The two of them have evolved over the last, I suppose we're almost hitting for about 30 years now, to develop this care trilogy of care of the land, care of the wildlife, and care of the people. So wherever there's a footprint, so wherever there's a, an and beyond lodge, there's a commitment to conserving the wild spaces that surround that lodge and that ultimately attracts the tourism, and then working with the communities that are the ultimate custodians of those, those wild spaces as well. So the... The idea of care of the land, care of the wildlife, the, of care of the people is that, you know, without any one of those links, the others mm-hmm. are not supported. So and beyond has been slowly um, gaining a bigger and bigger marine footprint. So Member Island, which is just off the northern, northeastern tip of Zanzibar, yes. uh, came into the, the and beyond portfolio in the mid or early, early to the 90s, so around 1994. So that's been part of the, the family for a long time. And that, that for a long time was the only marine site. And then about eight years ago, uh, Benguera Island, so in the Bazaruta Archipelago in southern Mozambique, that was added. And then a few years ago, about uh, three or four years ago, Vermezi Island in the northern Kurimbas Archipelago in northern Mozambique uh, was also added to the portfolio. So suddenly there's this, this growing expanse of marine properties that have, have joined the fold. And, and beyond an Africa Foundation have done phenomenal work over the, the terrestrial spaces and uh, across the safari lodges. And now on three mm-hmm. continents, actually, which is quite remarkable, including South America and Asia. This marine space, you know, you've got, if you're living by your, your care trilogy and the terrestrial spaces, you need to apply the same in the marine space. The idea was that, you know, let's, let's get serious about this. And how do we, how do we tackle this in, a, in this new environment? So Oceans Without Borders was, was born mm-hmm. initially just as a concept of recognition that we need to be explicitly addressing marine conservation concerns and applying this trilogy to the marine space. Yeah. I was just finishing up my PhD. I had a, a previous link with Vermezi. I, I fell in love with that about 10 years ago. So I've been, I had a long association with the island and that's that's how I connected. And when Just Kent, the CEO of and Beyond, when he showed me the this map of, you know, the sites uh, that were intended to be part of this Oceans Without Borders project, I was like, man, this is just the most incredible opportunity, <laughs> you know, because for me, it's just incredibly productive. It's got so much diversity. The currents have been sweeping across the Indian Ocean, just depositing 
all kinds of amazing diversity of life there. So the, the incredible numbers of corals and fish and all kinds of marine diversity on the site. It's also, like I was saying, it's got those huge drop-offs. So it, it sits very close to the water mm-hmm. of the deep Mozambican Channel. So the reefs there have stayed really healthy despite warming ocean temperatures that are causing bleaching in other places in the world. So the reefs are very resilient. And then they're also very productive. So there's there's a huge mass coral spawning that happens every year. And it's one of the only sites besides the Great Barrier Reef um, where that's actually known to happen. There, as I mentioned, there's the shark breeding site. There are lots of segregation sites. So it's this very productive place. And then from there, so that's our central site. From there, uh, the currents travel from Vermezi down towards Benguera in the Bezaruta archipelago and then up north towards uh, Nemba Island. So if you can... So we've got this opportunity to, to protect Vermezi, which is this amazing source site that's productive, resilient, putting out all this amazing life. And just to explain, so I'm sure, you know, I always assume everyone's a marine biologist, but uh, <laughs> marine life travels in the water. It travels in the currents. So when fish create um, eggs, when they spawn, that travels in the water. When corals spawn and those eggs are fertilized in the water column, that travels in the water. So the mm-hmm. currents travel easy carry all of that life for a certain distance and then they're deposited on new sites so yes. by having a site to the north and to the south of of Bermizi, you've got stepping stones where you can then work with the local communities you know work with the resources that come from from ecotourism with the awareness that's generated mm-hmm. from ecotourism to protect those sites to create stepping stones up and down the coast yeah so that's the whole backstory <laughs> sorry it's a little bit long but the, the objectives of, of Oceans Up Water sit around that. So initially it's to to create strong baselines. So like we were saying, you know, there's this the shifting baselines in on the planet in general, um, but definitely in marine conservation. So to create strong monitoring programs where we can establish baselines, where we can use surveys and monitoring and strong research to to demonstrate exactly what's happening in our oceans, to understand what's happening at our sites so that we can make decisions that are driven by data and then monitor the impact of those decisions. So are we making the right decisions? Is it something to change? And if we're getting it right, then we know how we're doing it. So getting those baselines in place and whether that's working with communities or working in the water, it's, it's, it's all completely interconnected. And then the core part of our objectives is obviously care of the land, wildlife and people. So the land in this context is largely watery. <laughs> okay, yes. So it's, it's creating those spaces yeah so working towards getting the legislation in place to protect tracts tracts of of our ocean and protecting Mm -hmm. those core sites they may be totally protected or it might be an integrated version where we work with communities that say look we need to harvest these particular things at these times of years but at but other times we can close it or we use particular gears or you know whatever it is so finding a a conservation strategy that's that's manageable um, and sustainable and then wildlife is obviously you know the the big guys that I love, the sharks and, um, you know, giant trevallio, other species we work with, turtles, whales, um, you know, all of the big charismatic animals and, and wildlife that, that occupy these marine spaces. And they're very important in terms of capturing people's imagination and motivating for conservation, um, but also in the ecosystems. You know, they're, um, they're very key indicators of what the rest of the ecosystem is looking like below them. And they also help us to identify where the important places are that we need to protect. So if we can monitor their movements, we can see where are the key spots that we need to make sure we absolutely have locked away and, and looked after. And then our fourth objective is, is care of the people. And you you can do all the marine-focused conservation you want, but in East Africa and in much of the world, if you don't work with people that, that are the custodians of those ecosystems, the users of those ecosystems, then, you know, all the rest of the effort is in vain. So we work very closely with with communities at each of these sites um, to make sure that the mm. what we what we put in place is sustainable in terms of their needs and their capacity and, and to build the capacity within local communities to be able to be effective custodians of those resources for many generations. And then our last one is, is um, a global reach concept. So an objective of creating global awareness. So through and beyond being an ecotourism company, it, it gives us this phenomenal opportunity to connect to people all over the world. And a lot of those people, you know, by virtue of the fact that it's high end travel, are people that have great influence in in the lives in their lives back home, wherever they are. So by connecting those people with these wild ecosystems, where they're you know very often quite emotionally affected by 
these incredible spaces by so by putting them in these environments where they're inspired, they're motivated um, to make a change, to really you know get to understand and figure out how they can make a difference, and then offering education and you know explanations for for how they can actually play a positive role in conserving these ecosystems, you can actually influence the way they then go about their lives um, in their bigger context where they have great influence. So it's an amazing platform for change and creating awareness as well. Mm. So just as, as an example, you know, you, you speak about education and, and, and changing people's behavior. What are some of the simple things that the average person can do to make a difference to the oceans? Yeah, so the oceans are, they're, they, they're quite unique, you know, compared to land spaces in terms of um, how connected we all are. It's actually, it's very easy to have a positive impact on the ocean. So like I was saying before, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, no matter where you are, whether you're, you know, completely landlocked, you know, in La Paz, <laughs> in a city that's, you know, at high altitude, far away from the ocean, your impact's all connected, you know. So like I was saying before, carbon carbon levels in our atmosphere are one of the biggest drivers of change, uh, particularly in, in my favorite ecosystem, in the, in the coral reef ecosystems. And to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is, is very easy mm-hmm. in terms of our, our daily actions. You know, we just... Fundamentally, if we consume less, so if we buy less, we produce less carbon. Everything that we buy that's manufactured is producing carbon dioxide. We need energy to run the factories that make the stuff that we buy. So in very basic terms, you know, if you if you try to, when you're doing your groceries, buy things that are less manufactured, so more in terms of foods, buy raw foods, uh, the less packaging they have, the better, because then no one's had to manufacture a plastic bag to put on your veggies. Also, by virtue of buying something that doesn't have a plastic bag on it, then you don't need to dispose of the plastic bag, which means there's no chance of that getting back into the ocean and has having an impact. So the more you can reduce your um, your consumption, the kinder you've been to, been to the planet. So any ways that you can find to trade more lightly mm-hmm. wherever you can, that's, that's a huge... It's a, it's a very underestimated way to make a difference, but the, cumulatively, we can make such a difference by just minimizing our impact on the planet through through consuming less. And um, the more you kind of start down that route and start looking for little ways that you can you can reduce your amount of consumption, the more you find that you can do. So I think it's very important to realize that, you know, no one gets it right all the time. I mean, I... I confess that, you know, I, there are occasions when I will maybe buy a plastic bag from a shop <laughs> because there are those circumstances where sometimes that's just what you need to do. Yeah. But I think the important thing with this is, is you know, forgive yourself for those. You know, mm. a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I can never make all the changes that are necessary. I just, you know, someone else is going to do it. I just, I don't have the capacity. I'm too busy or I don't have the money to buy, you know, all these locally sourced products and things like that. And that's fine. Do what you can. I think the really, really important thing is to to learn as much as you can, find out as much as you can. The more awareness you have about what you're buying and what you're supporting, the more information you have to make your choices, to make wise, wise choices. You know, in the world today, I, I don't think if for some people, but, you know, for, for most of the people that we interact with and most of the people that would be listening to, to our chat, you know, ignorance is... is not really an excuse anymore. You know, we have access to so much information. If you don't know what to do, Google it. You know, how can I, how can I make a difference? Ask Google. And uh, yeah, just the, the other thing, I guess, is, and this is a, a big one with the changes we're seeing now is obviously in terms of carbon emission is, um, is travel. If you want to reduce your impact, then this is a very bad thing to say. <laughs> Someone that is uh, quite advocate of the power of travel actually as well. But, you know, um, doing it wisely. Think about it. It's, again, it's down to awareness. You know, find out what are the impacts of your actions and decide, you know, sometimes there's pros and cons to actions and weigh them up and and make an educated choice. And if you can have a strong impact in some space in your life, that's great. And in others, less so, it's okay. <laughs> we all just do the best we can. Yeah. And I guess, you know, the other thing is that in terms of direct impact on the oceans, you know, the the fish side of things. So, you know, do we do we eat fish? What fish do we eat? How do we how do we go about that? And I know that that's often a big question. And even for you know marine scientists, it's it's quite a it's quite a big thing to try and figure out because we all love the oceans. We've generally grown up eating fish. But I think, you know, a couple of rules of thumb mm-hmm. is just to 
eat less fish, eat less protein if you can. And when you do, you know, value it and enjoy it. And, and that's, that's fine. The lower down you eat in the food chain, and this is science talk again, but um, you know, if you think about a sardine, a sardine is in a, it's in a big school of sardines and it kind of, it's a, it's, it eats things that are lower down the food chain. So it's a, it's a fish that um, generally is more sustainable because it's using less energy to grow, right? Because it's lower down. Whereas something like a tuna um, is sitting right at the top of the food chain. It eats other fish to keep alive. It has very high energy um, needs. It travels big distances across the ocean. So it requires a lot of resources to grow a piece of tuna. So the more you can eat, when you do eat fish, eat things that are lower down the food chain. And again, ask Google if you need ideas rather than, you know, the top predators in the ecosystem. And then the other thing is that there, you know, Google's one resource, but there's there's so many great who fish sustainable seafood guides out there these days. So in South Africa, we have Sassy. You can get Sassy as an app on your phone and literally at the restaurants and you don't know what the fish is, ask the, ask the restaurant, you know, what is the fish? Make them accountable as well because yeah. that's important. Find out what it is, stick it in your mm -hmm. app, find out what the impacts are and then make your decisions mm -hmm. because you're informed. And most developed countries around the world have that sort of resource. So there's, there's lots of information. I think be informed, mm -hmm. make your decisions based on your information. I think one of the really important things for me is just being aware that even as somebody who's sitting, you know, in the middle of the country somewhere landlocked and seemingly miles away from the ocean, the choices that you make do have an impact and, and can make a difference. Absolutely. And and that's the thing, you know, with, with the oceans is, is because all of, because they're so connected to each of our lives, you know, you, you can have a huge impact regardless of how close you are to the oceans in a very real way every day. Mm -hmm just by thinking about how likely you can tra tread on the planet. Now, you've spoken, when you answered that question, you spoke about the manufacturing and the impact that that has. One of the silver linings that has come down, come out of the sort of global shutdown related to COVID-19 is the significant drop in pollution in oceans, rivers, and lakes. How do you see this playing out post-pandemic? And do you think that there are ways in which we can ensure that pollution levels remain low? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, like you said, it, it really, the fundamental thing is awareness. I think, you know, COVID is, is offering us as a global mm. society a, an opportunity for a major reset, you know, in the way we do everything. And, you know, I think there's, in a lot of political spaces, you know, I, I think we're seeing that, you know, there's, we've all been forced to stop yes. and just be <laughs> and um the way we re-engage on the planet and, and restart our economies and our societies is is going to be critical in mm -hmm. terms of the way this yeah. planet looks in the next 10 years you know and for our futures you know sylvia earl says i was part of a, a, a webinar conference with her mm -hmm. last week and she was saying that you know our decisions now and the way we act in the next 10 years in in her opinion are the most important for the next 10,000 years and that's because we're at this incredible, really key tipping point on our planet. And, uh, you know, things like um, plastic pollution, you know, the, mm -hmm. it's seeing the difference that can happen in such a short space of time. I think, you know, we need to grab that and use it as a, a, an example of, you know, this is what is possible. We've done this. <laughs> okay. We've reduced, we've reduced plastic. We've reduced carbon emissions. We have these prior to COVID, you know, we, it was just the way we went about life in the world and it was the norm and everyone's too busy to really think about doing it any differently and it's too much effort to change the way we do it. During the pandemic currently, you know, we've been forced to do it differently and we've been forced to make that change very, very, very quickly, you know, overnight for some of us. And I think we need to hang on to that and go, look what's possible, you know, we're, we're doing this. It's not a matter of changing anything, we're mm -hmm. doing it. So let's keep doing it right, you know, let's maintain these lessons that we learn. But it, it really is down to to each one of us recognizing that and taking those lessons forward and and demanding it in in our communities, in our societies, in our workplace, and saying, you know, let's let's take these lessons. It's been a tough time, but there's some amazing uh, benefits that come out of it. And one of them, like you say, is is obviously the reduced pollution levels. Mm. On the flip side of that, um Obviously, you know, people are are using disposable masks and 
single-use plastics to keep things sort of sealed and, and untouched. Do you think that there's a concern about what kind of effect this is going to have further down the line? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think, you know, I think we're all realizing that this COVID-19 world that we find ourselves in is is not going to um, change overnight either. I think we're, we're going to be living with things like, you know, face masks and gloves and uh, all that sort of thing for, for a long time to come. But I think we, you know, we just need to get innovative around it. And, and I've seen some great innovation. I mean, you know, through our Africa Foundation networks, there are a lot of craft groups and things like that. And, you know, a lot of them have just instantly moved to making masks. And I know when I, you know, I'm in Zululand at the moment or in, in uh, KwaZulu Natal and you go into town and everyone's got the funkiest masks on, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, it's a fashion statement and they're all made out of cotton and, you know, so mm. obviously that's not in the hospital context, but, you know, we, we live in a world where yeah. the opportunity for innovation is, is just amazing. So, one of our partners through um, the Ocean Family Foundation, who are w- one of the biggest supporters of, of Oceans Without Borders, they have a we have a sister project to them called a Plastic Planet. It's a duo of two remarkable women who um, they're changing the the narrative around around plastic, and a lot of it is what they're saying is that we rely on plastic for so much in our lives, and that's not going to go away. So whether it's for masks and, and for gloves, or for shopping bags, or for heart surgery you know the stints and things that you put into your body that save lives you know they're they're made out of plastic it's convenient it's useful and we live in a society that's not going to give that up anytime soon but there are other ways of manufacturing it so they're they've got they're building this portfolio of unbelievable substitutes so different materials that we can use instead of plastic one of their latest innovations has been you know these face shields that everyone's using instead of a mask with a clear face shield They've developed a, a plastic-free face shield, fully biodegradable. It stops any kind of transmission potential, mm-hmm. you know, a plastic one would. And uh, yeah, yeah, totally non-plastic. So we have we have the technology to, to find alternatives. We just need to, well, I suppose, as a society, demand it. Look for those, buy mm-hmm. those options, um, make those choices you know, when, we, when we buy things. Yeah, mm-hmm. hopefully, hopefully the change is, you know, it becomes a groundswell where it's... Um, the the non plastic becomes the norm, um, and when we then that drives the innovation, and there's more. It becomes the obvious economic and ecological alternative. Now you've mentioned the significance of the next ten years in in marine conservation. Where do you see marine conservation as a whole heading during that time, and how do you think we can get the situation turned around? And to sort of offset some of the the pretty scary projection projections that we've heard about in terms of the need to protect marine environments and, and marine species before they're entirely wiped out. Yeah, so this is a big one here, and the, the clock is ticking. Mm-hmm. But I think it's uh, it's an exciting time to be to be in the marine conservation space because I mean, you know, even if I think even if you're not particularly focused on marine conservation or you know tuned into that world i think most people would be aware that there is a growing recognition of the urgency of of finding sustainable solutions for our oceans and that that mm-hmm. growing awareness and that that you know increasing recognition of the need for big change is is very exciting and uh, i think it's like you say we've got we've got very short time scales to do this um, we've got to turn this thing around quickly and for that reason, it's got to be on global mm-hmm. agendas. You know, it's got to be in, you know, high level political conversations. It's not something that we sort of, you know, can talk about in, in marine conservation circles and, you know, scientific labs and, you know, <laughs> conservation groups. It's got to be, it's got to be at scale. And mm-hmm. the exciting thing is that um, there are a number of avenues that are really starting to drive this agenda. So one of the key ones is the Sustainable Development Goals um, released by the United Nations. And um, so that maps out 17 goals that have been identified as the key, mm-hmm. the key areas of focus that we need to put a, give attention to, uh, to, to develop a sustainable life on our planet. And those goals have been set, the intention being met by 2030. And within those, global 
the, the SDG, so Global um, Sustainable Development Goal number 14 is life below water, which is great conservation, right? That's our oceans. And it maps out very clearly, you know, what are the what are the key things, what are the key metrics that we should be measuring our actions by? Mm-hmm. And those, those metrics can be used, you know, across everything from conservation organizations to industry, political level, the country level. So there's a very clear framework mm-hmm. that we can use to measure our actions and the success of the changes that we make. And I think those SDGs provide a, a an international language and kind of tool set that we can use to act collectively to to drive the change that needs to happen. Um, and it gives us a language as well to use, you know, if you because I find that's that's very often the biggest sticking point in terms of having the sorts of intersectoral conversations that need to happen is that we just speak different languages. A marine scientist takes things for granted that a politician would and vice versa. And, you know, getting over those hurdles is like, you know, can take years of working together. And the SDGs, I think, you know, provide a lot of the language um, to make those conversations, to make them productive and meaningful very quickly. And, you know, I mentioned the the intersectoral side, and that's something that the UN have identified as as being a really important component of this change is, is intersectoral conversations. And that's the where this whole idea of the blue economy is is coming forward and really kind of sitting on the front of global agendas. And it's, you know, they're conferences. I, I was at a conference last year that was so inspiring. Uh, so The Economist hosted a, um, a conference on the, the blue economy and building bridges was the theme. And that's exactly where it's at. You know, it's got to be it's got to be politicians talking to business, talking to shipping, talking to the marine scientists, talking to mining. You know, it's it's all completely interrelated. And all of those industries and sectors have major stakes in the ocean. And if we don't work together and, and talk together about how do we how do we do this thing in a way that's economically sustainable and profitable, politically acceptable and profitable and sustainable and environmentally sustainable, you know, then no no sector is going to stand on its own so having those intersectoral conversations i think is really where it's at and the fact that they're starting to happen is incredibly exciting mm. on a on a more personal note what is it that gives you specifically hope for marine conservation in the future um i think for me the you know because it's like you say it's a it's a space that's um there's a lot of doom and gloom so to to find the hope is important but I think, you know, seeing this, like we were just saying now with the sustainable development goals and the blue economy, seeing those conversations happening and seeing them happening on international stages is, and, you know, with the heads of massive corporations and mining and heads of countries having these conversations, you know, that that's exciting for me. And I think the, the potential for change, you know, humans de- demonstrating their capacity for very rapid change. I think that is very exciting for me. That that's because that's what we need. And you know, like the the plastic revolution that happened is, you know, there was that image of a turtle with a, a plastic straw up its nose, and that image <laughs> mobilized change like I never dreamed yeah. was possible. I mean, plastic straws became taboo overnight, mm-hmm. like literally within a few months around the world, across the planet. Yes, and if we mobilize change that quickly and I mean that was one turtle mm-hmm. with one plastic straw up its nose and it, it created a revolution you know? so we've demonstrated that we can make change you know and uh it's COVID I think for me is another example is the the level of change that's happened across the board around the planet you know at a a massive scale in terms of the way we live our lives day to day and we've done it you know we've switched gears within days we have the capacity for change and I think that's that's where my hope sits you know it's it's really seeing how resourceful and adaptable human beings can be and then having the opportunity from you know for in, in my personal space sitting in a, a position where I'm in a an industry that interacts with so many you know such a broad section of society globally you know i'm working with local communities on islands who are very directly connected to their marine resources but also dealing with some of the most influential people on the planet in terms of business and driving economies 
and seeing the potential on our planet now with the communication systems we have and you know the fact that we're having this conversation now that technology is facilitating such a growth of awareness so through connecting people with wild places, working with people on the ground, using technology and communication systems, uh, disseminating information through, the, you know, these really amazing channels, you know, things like Instagram are amazingly powerful these days. So having all these avenues for change from really grassroots stuff with communities locally to media channels to, you know, influence through ecotourism, I think there's just, mm -hmm. there's more capacity and potential for change than there ever has been before. And we're we're showing that we're capable of it as well. Yeah, that's where that's where my hope sits. Tessa, thank you so much. That's uh, I think that's a really positive note to leave it on. It's been absolutely fascinating chatting to you, and I can't wait to have you back. Thank you very very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Kash. I really appreciate it, and it's lovely to talk to a fellow passionate ocean lover. <laughs> absolutely, I've been missing the diving very very much. Oh, you too. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we'll be back in the water again soon. Thank you for listening to and Beyond Fireside Chats. Don't forget to subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. If you have any comments or feedback, or would like to suggest a topic you'd like to hear us talk about, drop us an email at firesidechats at endbeyond.com. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs>